anybody who watches any television at all will have noticed the influx of what I call strange insurance commercials. They're flooding the cable networks nowadays. And I, for one, am not impressed by them. Call me an old curmudgeon, if you will, but I just can't get into emus riding around in old Plymouths or Bigfoots named Daryl or half-men, half-motorcycle creatures or imposters pretending to be NBA stars. Now, I can handle talking geckos, okay, but I'm more in tune with the slogans of yesteryear, back when insurance companies had jingles. Jingles like, you're in good hands with all state or Nationwide is on your side, or the company that I was with for years, like a good neighbor, State Farm, is there. Those slogans actually had something to say about the quality of the insurance product that you were getting ready to buy from the company. And maybe I'm hopeless, but I just like having a real person to call when I need to talk to my insurance agent. And there are some people who still operate their businesses like that. Well, back in the days of Jesus, there wasn't any such thing as insurance companies. If there had been, the traveler in today's parable could have sure used one. He's been robbed, he's been beaten up, he's been left for dead on the side of the road. And the worst part of it is, guys, he's, he can't get anybody to stop and, and help him. If anybody needs a good neighbor, it's this man. Let me read the story to you. Jesus tells it in Luke chapter 10. He starts with verse 25. Listen to the story of the Good Samaritan. One day an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his action, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling on a trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side of the road. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his donkey, and he took him to an inn where he took care of him. And the next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I come through. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits, Jesus asked. And the man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said to him, yes, now go and do likewise. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Guys, whether you grew up in Sunday school or not, most all of us have heard some version of the story of the Good Samaritan. It has actually become another way in the English language of describing what a good neighbor is. <clears throat> Franklin Graham points to this story in the scripture as the inspiration behind his entire organization called Samaritan's Purse. Many of us have done the shoe boxes at Christmas or participated in some relief program somewhere uh, of Samaritan's Purse. And the main mission of Samaritan's Purse is to be the hands and feet of Jesus around the world, to be the embodiment of what it means to be a good neighbor. 
But before we get into the story itself about what a neighbor is, we got to get acquainted with the man who mo motivated Jesus to tell the story in the first place. Luke tells us that he is a lawyer. But he's not a lawyer in the sense that we think of lawyers today. Back then, at least in the Jewish culture, the law that everybody referred to, it was the religious law. There was no distinction between the civil law and the religious law back then. The religious law was the civil law. And whatever the religious leaders said, that's what went. However, they interpreted the Old Testament laws and all of the books that they had written since then, that was what the law was. There was no way of appealing a decision that they would make. There wasn't an appeals process like in our court system today. And this is the kind of lawyer who comes to Jesus with the question, who is my neighbor? He is an expert at interpreting and then applying those laws that governed people's lives. And the fact is, <clears throat> if you really get down to what's in this man's heart, the question that he asked Jesus here, he didn't come to ask Jesus to teach him anything about being a good neighbor. He asked Jesus in order to discredit him, to challenge him, to expose Jesus, to shame him, to try to get him to say something that could be used to turn people against Jesus. That's what the lawyer's motives were. To really get the whole picture of what's going on here, you've got to go back to the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke and read the first nine chapters. And that's what I've been doing this week. And what I've discovered in those first nine chapters is a growing tension between the message that Jesus is preaching about God and how God wants to relate to his creation and the message that is being taught by the religious leaders. All these so-called experts thought that the God of the Old Testament, the one who had delivered them from Egypt, the one who had given Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the God of Abraham and Isaac and of Jacob, he was their God, a God who was supposed to deliver Israel, to make Israel the greatest nation on earth to establish them as a world power, much like Egypt and Babylon and now Rome had become. That was the goal. They were supposed to be the ones that God gave all the glory to. And that glory that they saw, <clears throat> it wasn't achieved by loving your neighbor. It was achieved by conquering your neighbor. The whole thing for this lawyer and all the other experts that had it in for Jesus, it boiled down to the fact that they were so caught up in pushing their own exclusive definition of what neighbor is that they had absolutely no interest in hearing God's true definition of neighbor. You see, Jesus came to get everybody back on track. He came to show people what was actually written in the Old Testament, what it actually pointed to. Jesus came to get Israel to see you have been chosen by God, chosen to be God's instrument to offer salvation to the world, to show the rest of the world who the true God really is, what God really stands for, that he's a God of peace and love and not a God of war and conquering. And by the time we get to chapter 10, the, the tension is so thick in the air between the message of Jesus and the message of the religious leaders that you can cut it with a knife. Folks, here's the truth about that tension. For people back in the first century and also for us today as followers of Jesus, Jesus has a profoundly different definition of neighbor than most everybody else who's ever walked the face of the earth. It's not just the expert lawyers that class with Jesus. It's not just them that got it wrong. It's pretty much every other society as well. Everywhere I've been in the world, that tension is there because no matter where I go, the prevailing notion is that we've got to take sides and pit ourselves against the other side to get ahead. We see that in our society today. We think we've got to conquer our enemies before they conquer us because you see, the ultimate prize in the eyes of the world is security. Security 
defined by the world, security that's bought by political power and financial success and public influence and conquering your enemy. If you want that security, the world tells you, you got to take it. That's the source of the tension between Jesus, the message that he's preaching, and the worldly message that that lawyer believed. Guys, I want you to contrast the picture that I just painted with the motives of the good neighbor in Jesus' parable today. I really don't think nationality had a whole lot to do with it. I don't think Jesus cared very much whether this man was a Jew or a Samaritan. He made him a Samaritan to make his point to this Jewish leader. He's trying to show him it's not God's will for one group of human beings to have desire for dominion over another group of human beings. That's not why God created us. It's not God's will to have hatred in your heart for another human being. It's not God's will for us to be so caught up in ourselves and our own selfish desires and accomplishing what we think we need to accomplish that we neglect the needs of others, that we're willing to step on others to get what we want. Jesus came to deliver a message to show human beings who had ears to hear, I have a better way for you to live. Let me show you what will happen if enough people start loving their neighbor as God loves them, loving their neighbor as they love themselves, when enough people start getting serious about hearing Jesus when he preaches in the Sermon on the Mount, about sharing their blessings with others, about putting into action that which Jesus spent so much time trying to teach us. Guys, that's why I get so excited about going on building teams or building relationships with other people who don't know Jesus. I get excited about going to places like Roatan where we can help people get clean water and get an opportunity to share the love of Jesus with them in tangible ways. That's why I serve on the board of several of the ministry agencies here in our own community. It's not because I enjoy policy making and administrative stuff. I can't stand that stuff if you want to know the truth, but I do it anyway. It's also not because I enjoy getting air sick when I get on a plane. It happens just about every time. There's a reason why I drive on most of the mission trips. If you've never been with me somewhere, I like to drive because I get car sick if I sit in the back seat. You see, I do these things not because they make me comfortable and secure. I do them because God's commanded me to. Jesus, the one that I have committed to follow, says to me, love your neighbor as yourself. And guys, when I do that, when we do that as a community of believers, when we go out of our way to be a neighbor as Jesus defines it, even when it means being inconvenienced and making sacrifices on our own behalf, we're going to get blessed. We get blessed beyond measure every time we reach out to a neighbor with Jesus' love. And pursuing that blessing is what begins to rule our days. I never thought I'd hear myself saying what I'm about to say in 100 years. But I even get blessed at Walmart. Yes, Walmart. Y'all know how I feel about Walmart. It's one of those love-hate relationships that I have. I like going and looking at all the stuff, but I just, I hate the crowds. If I had my way, I'd go at two o'clock in the morning if I could get up and go because there's nobody there then. But I like going and looking, but I don't like the crowds of people. People everywhere that you turn, it gets on my last nerve. But what I'm learning is that God can even use Walmart. Yes, the thing that I detest, he can use that to give me opportunities to be a good neighbor because I come in contact with other people there. And that's the key. The other day, I was busily going down one of the roads at Walmart trying to not go the wrong way because you're supposed to go one way or the other. And I encountered this mother and the teenage son there. The son had some disability uh, that I could tell that uh, you could just tell by looking at him and there was something going on, but he was still able to be there and help his mom get things off the shelf. And when I came around the corner, I noticed him reaching as hard as he could reach up to try to get something off the very top shelf, but he couldn't quite reach it. 
and he was losing his balance. And I'm, I thought to myself, if he falls into that shelf, it's going to be a disaster. So I approached and humbly asked the moms, can, can I help you? And she immediately said, yes, you can help us. And so I asked the young man, what is it you're trying to reach? And so he showed me, and, and I was about two inches taller than him, so I could reach it and get it down, and I gave it to him. And this is the honest truth. That lady thanked me three times before I could get back to my buggy and go on about my business. And that's the end of chapter one. But here's chapter two. It, it helped. Something else happened when I got to the parking lot. It's been hot as blazes this summer. And the heat wave in August was, was terrible. This day was no different. It was probably 95 or 100 degrees in the parking lot. And I came out and I saw this older lady trying to get her groceries in the trunk. And she was obviously struggling. And so I decided I'm, I'm just going to ask her if she wants some help. And I didn't scare her. She said, yeah, I would love some help. She was just about done, but she still had this big case of water. So I got the water and I put it in the trunk for her and took her buggy back to the bin. And guys, as I was going back to my car, I realized something really, really important. I could have just as easily gotten angry, angry with other people while I was shopping. In fact, I do get angry with other people when I'm shopping sometimes. I'll admit that. I get angry more often than I try to help people. But when I choose to bless others, when I intentionally choose to be the good neighbor that Jesus calls me to be, my heart overflows. And my anger doesn't rule me anymore. It is so very easy for us to go about our days getting caught up in all of our schedules and our agendas and building walls around ourselves that we simply ignore the opportunities Jesus gives us to be in relationship with other people, be a neighbor to them as he defines it. I do it just like everybody else does it. But when we all realize that about ourselves and when we repent of that sin that we're committing against our creator, this gives God a powerful tool that he can use to build his kingdom on earth because his peace begins to rule your heart instead of your dissatisfaction. So here's the question that I want you to go away pondering today. Am I available to God to be the kind of neighbor he calls me to be? Am I willing, as a follower of Jesus, am I willing to surrender my own will and my time and my money and my opinions and my energies and my abilities, am I willing to surrender that to the will of the Father? You see, that lawyer who confronts Jesus in today's text, he answers with an emphatic no. But thank God there were many people in that crowd that day that said yes. Guys, look at me. That lawyer made up his mind. But the jury's still out for you and me. You and I still have an opportunity. That means we got time to allow Jesus to change our hearts. Time to say, yes, Lord, I am willing to let you change me so that I can be the kind of neighbor you call me to be, so that I can become a powerful tool that you can use to build your kingdom of peace on earth. May it be so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.